this is the second part of this iOS chapter for the specific vulnerabilities, the jailbreak vulnerabilities and so on. Um, so we're just going to talk about attacks that have already attacked the iPhone. And there are very few of them, and they're not anything much to worry about, as you'll see, but there are a few of them. Uh, the jailbreaking vulns are the uh, vulnerabilities that make it possible to take complete control of the device and wrest back control from Apple so you can do anything you want. And a few of them could be done remotely. So Jailbreak 3 had a PDF bug and then a kernel bug. So you could view a page in a browser that was a PDF file. It would then exploit the browser and get out. And then it would exploit the kernel and elevate itself to root so they could remove the protection that Apple put on your device. And you could do this all by just viewing a web page, which was pretty cool. Um, of course, that means you could do this to it, people that did not want to jailbreak their device by just getting them to view a malicious page and such. So there's a font handling bug in a PDF file. And then there was a type conversion bug that led to arbitrary code execution with system level privileges, which was the kernel exploit. So now you can modify the OS and take away Apple's protection. So you view a malicious PDF and then you exploit the kernel. Now, this was patched in 2011. So your device would have to be old and badly out of date to be vulnerable to this anymore. Um, so your best protection, like almost everything in security, is to patch stuff. If you get up to the latest patches, then these known jailbreaks will not work. And it's getting harder and harder to find jailbreaks that work on modern versions of iOS. All right, so if you jailbreak, you have to have a really old version of iOS. Then you jailbreak it, and then you can't install patches from the official sources. So you're going to have to keep using the old unpatched OS, or you're going to have to go find unofficial sources, or you're going to have to update and then re-jailbreak if that is indeed possible. Usually, if you update to the latest version, many of the major versions, there won't be any known update, any, any known jailbreak for it. Um, and that's especially since iOS had over-the-air patching after iOS 5 and later. Anyway, that supposedly lets you put some updates on your jailbroken devices. When people first jailbroke their devices, they did not know much about what they were doing. And they would just turn on SSH so they can connect to the device and have the default name and password. So the first worm was the iKey worm that would just change your background to Rick Astley, uh, just sort of to tag you back. This is the way MS-DOS viruses used to be back in the 80s and 90s. It would just say Chernobyl or something on the day Chernobyl melted down, not really to destroy your machine, but just to like notify you that you have a vulnerability. So this was a spreading worm. Um, it scanned some network blocks, found port 22, logged in with the default passwords. Then when it got in, it would uh, turn off the SSH server and scan for and infect more devices. So it would actually spread from machine to machine if you have a large number of jailbroken iOS devices with the default password on the same network. So I don't know how often that really spread. Remember, there was another uh, proof of concept worm that would spread on Symbian devices by like Bluetooth. So if you had vulnerable Symbian devices within a few feet of each other walking past in a crowd, it could in principle spread. In practice, if you look at epidemiology, you have to have a certain density of vulnerable, uh, vulnerable infectable organisms for anything to spread. And I think in both cases here, the actual uh, vulnerable devices were sparse enough that it did not really spread very far. Anyway, they put in a botnet functionality. And so it was a the first real malware, if you want to look at it that way, although it was not very harmful and it didn't spread very far, it just showed that iOS is not immune to malware. You can make spreading malware sometimes. But all this would only affect you if you jailbroke your device and you were sloppy about it and didn't consider the security consequences. So the IKEA source code is out there, closed source and very hacky. Anyway, um, it attempts to scan and infect more devices. So if you just don't jailbreak your device, this won't happen to you. If you do, then you're going to have to, and you install SSH, then change the password. Um, it's a good idea not to just leave SSH on all the time anyway. And if you upgrade your to the latest jailbreakable version, you'd be better off than leaving it really old. I mean, this is, it's not a big deal. So what can you do to take over iOS? If you have network services like SSH on, you can attack them. But most iPhones don't have hardly any network services turned on. Um, if you can install an app, the app might have a vulnerability, and they often do, and then you can exploit that app. But usually the only thing you get from that is the ability to steal the data from that app. Um, which is fine. You can, of course, mess with the network traffic, like man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, and you can even do man-in-the-middle attacks over the, uh, the telephone network. 
and you can, if you have physical access to the device, you can do more. Um, what the FBI and law enforcement agents got used to up until about two years ago was you would seize an iPhone, you connect it with a USB cable, you would jailbreak it, then image all the data, and that was the standard thing they did. But now uh, that's not possible anymore. That, uh, they got pretty mad. In response to FBI requests, Apple upgraded their encryption so that you cannot steal an iPhone, wipe it, and resell it. And the consequence of that also was they can't get in the encryption to let the cops in there either. And they didn't know that was going to happen. They thought they were going to block the crooks but still let the cops in. And that's not what they did. Uh, if you don't install some listening process like SSH, your iPhone only has one port open and there are no known attacks for this. I went and found it. I think, I, yeah, I've scanned my device, scanned my iPhone years ago. You can run it with Nmap and you'll find that one port is open. Um, I don't really know what it does. I think it might have something to do with updates, but anyway, it doesn't have, nobody has ever found anything you can do with that one port that's open, any way to take over the device. So, uh, all right, here's some remote vulnerabilities. There's a ping of death back in 2009 that affected really versions of iOS, really early versions. There's a remote execution via SMS. Uh, there was actually a hilarious one in the first Android. I had the very first Android 1.0, and that had, if you just sent an SMS that had Unix commands in it, it would just execute them as root. It was bloody awesome. Um, and the first Windows phone, what all my friends had from Microsoft, had an SMS that would just freeze it up, and you'd have to hard reset it. They kept getting this frequently, the SMS of death. Anyway, um, Bonjour is UDP. Um, potentially vulnerable. There's the baseband modem, which can, goes out over the cell phone network, and in principle, you could run a femtocell and get in the middle, and then you could in principle run a modified femtocell and try sending deformed data to it and see if you could find a buffer overflow or something. Uh, the same thing in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but in practice, almost none of these have ever had large vulnerabilities found. I was at a, a Bay Thread a few years ago, and there was a guy there with a commercial vulnerability scanner, and I had the then brand new iPad Mini, and we scanned it, and in like 15 minutes, he found a zero day in Bluetooth. And I said, I was just posting, he said, oh, you can't tell anybody. I have to ask my boss, and he probably will tell me not to tell anybody because we'll offend Apple. And I'm like, dude, we found something, now we can't tell anybody? What's wrong with you? Anyway. So we never told anybody, and I, I don't know what happened. Anyway, um, Bluetooth, when Bluetooth was new, of course, it had a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, all right, and then there's this attack that was uh, done at the Focus 11 um, conference to show how you can, under certain conditions, combine enough vulnerabilities to make an actual scary iOS attack. So what he did was, you run a rogue access point, so the target will connect to it, um, now you're in the middle. Now you can intercept HTTPS traffic because there was a certificate chain validation vulnerability in 2011, so you could use fake HTTPS certificates, and it would fall for it. So now you can spoof secure websites. So now you can read somebody's Gmail. That's one thing you could do and steal their Gmail password and such because you're in the HTTPS man in the middle. Now normally, if you're on HTTP connections, you can use something like Beef and you can just inject arbitrary content to it because HTTP connections have no security. So every router they pass through could modify the data and you'd never know. But you can't do that with HTTPS when it works because nobody can send content that will be accepted except the originating server that has the private key. But since we've managed to put in a fake certificate here, you can modify the HTTPS page. So now in the secure Gmail page, he can add a jailbreak PDF, which will now jailbreak the thing. He modified the jailbreak so it doesn't put City on the desktop, so you won't know your phone is jailbroken. And then it can load SSH and VNC, and now somebody actually has full remote control of your phone when all you did was connect over Wi-Fi to Gmail and read your Gmail, which is, I mean, this is something at this time I did. I would go to DEF CON and I read my Gmail. I said, it's HTTPS, nobody can get in there. And they got in my account because at this time Gmail was not 100% HTTPS. After you first logged in, it would then send you a cookie, which was not encrypted, so they could get in your Gmail that way. But this actually breaks in over full, complete HTTPS. But this is only going to be possible when you find several vulnerabilities to work together, and as they get patched, it'll get more and more impractical. So if you, of course, if you update your device, that will uh, stop this. You could avoid joining uh, Wi-Fi networks, but that's not very practical. And not, sending sensitive, not putting sensitive data on your device is certainly a recommendation of OWASP, 
but many, many app developers have not gotten the memo, and they are putting sensitive data on your device, so you can't, um, that's not really under your control. So anyway, if you want to attack devices that are not jailbroken, then you have heavy administrative controls in the way. Um, you must deceive Apple to get in the App Store. Apple attempts to review the apps and see if they're malicious, and if they are, they won't put them in the store. And if they ever find out it's malicious, they'll kick the developer out of the store forever. So if you deceive them, you also have to deceive the end user. So if you somehow, if you trick Apple and Apple signs it, then they can install things from the App Store. Um, if a few apps have snuck through for a while, but they get caught before a line, before long. One of the first ones was Handy Light. Uh, back in like 2010, um, carriers had a real problem with bandwidth. Everybody wanted to connect through the mobile phone network, but they really didn't have enough bandwidth for that. In fact, there was a time period when, I think in New York City they, and in San Francisco both, for like a week, they ran out of bandwidth so you could not connect your brand new iPhone to the network. And they actually tried to invent disincentives to make you not use so much data. And this really, really, really got Steve Jobs mad. You make the thing, and then you try to stop people from using it. <laughs> But um, for a while, they had a serious problem with bandwidth. So the last thing they wanted was people using their iPhone to get their laptop on the internet over 3G. But that's what the customers all wanted, because then you had the internet everywhere instead of having to go to where a hotspot were. So uh, there was no app you could get that would give you this feature explicitly. And they made an app called a Handy Light that would do nothing more than make a flashlight. And it was secretly a tethering app. And this went on for several months. You could download this thing and get an unofficial tethering app, not approved by Apple, before Apple yanked it. And once you have it, one thing I don't think Apple has ever done yet is reach down and suck apps back off the phone after you install them, although in principle they can do it. Amazon did that with Kindle. There was like, they sold Brave New World, I think, in fact, <laughs> and they didn't have the rights. So you, after, they, after they bought it, they reached down and sucked it back off people's Kindles. And Google has done that. They've reached down and sucked apps back off people's Android phones. I don't think Apple has done it, but they might have. But they didn't do it in this case. Um, anyway, so Apple apparently missed that entire functionality in the review process. So the review process is certainly not perfect. Charlie Miller wrote InstaStock. This was supposed to be some kind of stock trading app, but it would, in fact, um, let your machine be remote controlled and put it in a botnet. And, he, and so what happened is they kicked him out forever. He now can't publish any more apps. Um, so, you know, it's, and he was clearly just a researcher doing it for, for security researching purposes, but Apple didn't care. You know, you're, they, you're, you're mean and rude. They kick you out of the playpen. You can't get back. Um, so, the only thing you can do about this is to trust Apple. I mean, you are trusting Apple to make sure everything in the store is good. There is no way a normal end user can audit those apps or do anything about them. You just have to trust Apple. There's nothing. You can't add a firewall. You can't add antivirus. They don't exist. They're not in the store. You can't put them on. So that's life. Um, but in fact, most people are perfectly content to trust Apple, and most people have a good experience and no malware and no problems by just trusting Apple to keep the developers in line. Um, there are vulnerable apps that have problems. Um, the original ones that come with iOS are the most serious because uh, they let you into the operating system and often run as root. So there are vulnerabilities in there. Third party apps, originally there were no third party apps, but when the App Store came out, um, there are vulnerabilities occasionally in apps and they have to update them to fix the vulnerabilities. Uh, but one thing is you can't take over the phone through third party. Uh, browser plugins. This is primarily how you take over PCs and and uh, mainly PCs for a long time. Back in maybe 2010, you would take over PCs primarily through uh, Microsoft Office, especially back in 2002, 2003. You take it over through Internet Explorer, Microsoft Office, or Windows phones, and then everyone started using browsers, and then all the browsers started using plugins like Java and Flash and Adobe PDF Reader. And for about eight years, those were the number one ways you got in because the plugins were vulnerable. And um, it's still often that way, but you don't have any of those plugins on the iPhone. So there really is not that much attack surface. Um, anyway, here's some examples of third party app vulns. The Citibank app stored sensitive banking information on the device. So if your device was stolen, that would expose it. Um, it's surprising how there are two or three cases where this actually became a scandal because I find this very commonly. And most people don't care, and they won't fix it. And I'll be showing you that later. But anyway, um, PayPal had a certificate validation issue, so you could make uh, SSL man-in-the-middle attacks. 
Uh, this turned out, this keeps coming back over and over. This particular app had a mistake. There were some libraries in iOS discovered about two years ago that caused something like 15% of apps to be vulnerable until a library got updated. Um, there have been a variety of these. Then there was a Skype app that had a uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability. So you could put script in the full name field, and that meant you could steal the contacts database from the outside. Um, here's when many apps stored credentials insecurely, including Facebook and Dropbox, so they could uh, copy the credentials off the device and reuse them. Then here's the ESPN Score Center, had a cross-site scripting and clear text authentication vuln, so it transmitted your password unencrypted over the network. Again, I find in Android so many apps do this, I'm surprised these even hit the news. But when the NFL app did this, they got very embarrassed and they greatly improved their security. And the NFL is now the most secure app I know on Android, by far, far more than the banking apps. Um, anyway, uh, so getting, if you do manage to find a vulnerability to take over an app, of course, then the only thing you're going to get is the data that app has access to, which due to sandboxing should be just the data used by that app, unless it's part of a suite of apps from the same manufacturer that might share the data between them, but you shouldn't be able to get very far. Um, if you really want to take over the phone, you've got to find a kernel level vulnerability and escalate yourself to root, and those are not thick on the ground anymore. So again, if you update your stuff, you, uh, it's, it's your main countermeasure, and I don't think you have any other countermeasures. If you have not jailbreaking your device, you can't do much else. So one, one big issue is your device may be stolen. Now, I heard year, every year I would hear the number one fastest growing crime in America was iPhone theft. They said those special earphones were just like a flag, steal this thing. But I haven't heard that much lately because I think that was the whole point. I think with the last, in the last three years, Apple has made it so that a stolen iPhone is completely useless. It's just a piece of junk to throw in the trash. You can't wipe it and resell it. Not because the previous user has it tied to their iCloud account, and you can't put it to any other use until that person logs in with their iCloud password to let go of it. And so I would imagine that theft problem is going down. In early versions of iOS, you could actually steal the device and then you could use a boot script to, to get past the encryption and steal all the data on it. But that's not true anymore. And here, I think, is an example of this thing. Yeah, here's one of these uh, uh, jailbreak and install. This is a, a creating SSH tunnel. This is the attack that brute forces its way in, I think, by just trying every pin. It turns out to, it was quite successful in earlier versions of iOS 6 and before. iExplorer, you can put on your computer and then connect with the USB table, and then you can browse the file system and copy the files. But those files should be encrypted, and you're going to have to get at them. Uh, there was uh, iOS versions up through 8, had, uh, you were able to use the emergency call feature or Siri to bypass the lock, and that would get you past the encryption, so that's an issue. And then you, of course, can brute force passwords. If you have a four-digit password, then it would take a maximum of 10,000 guesses to get in there. In fact, when they ask people what they're using for their password, a lot of them use common passwords. So even if you only get 10 guesses, you're going to get a lot more than 10 out of 1,000 hits. Um, anyway, that's an issue, and there are various tools you can buy. This box um, plugs in away and somehow electronically simulates pressing those buttons um, and will brute force its way in. This says it will give you the code within 6 seconds to 17 hours as it cries them all. And then there's iCloud. By the way, um, the, uh, the FBI got really, really mad because they couldn't get in uh, evidence phones anymore. But it's all kind of for nothing because almost everybody backs up their stuff on iCloud because the simple thing that everybody understands is if you lose your phone, you've lost all your contacts and messages and everything. So they connect it to iCloud just to have it. And iCloud has always been wide open to Apple and remains wide open to Apple. So if you synchronize your stuff to iCloud, the cops do not need to get in your phone. <laughs> um, so there's a, a talk from Elcomsoft, which is the company that does this professionally. They break into all kinds of encryption, especially phone encryption. Um, so here's iCloud, been around since 2011, gives you a bunch of storage, and everybody is strongly encouraged, as you know, if you get any kind of Apple device, it will just bug you constantly, connect to iCloud, connect to iCloud. And I don't know, some people say they're making money off it, but I think the real point is, many, many people lose or break their phone, and then they call calling tech support, how do I get my stuff back? And the answer is, if you didn't back it up on iCloud, you're not getting your stuff back. So. They're right. Most users would be a lot better off to back up their stuff because your phone is going to get wrecked. 
and then you need it. So it runs daily whenever you're connected to Wi-Fi and a power source. It does backups. You can force a backup if you want to. But the end result is um, there is a copy of all your data in iCloud. By the way, iCloud is stored on Microsoft Azure servers, which I, if I was Microsoft, I'd be trumpeting that in commercials. But anyway, um, somehow I, they, I guess they made a deal to be polite about it. But um, Apple has the encryption key, so they can get at the iCloud backup. Now, of course, that would seem to be necessary because you have to be able to restore it onto a new phone. And you can't have it encrypted with some key that relies on the old phone or it couldn't do its purpose of putting your data on a new phone. So it kind of has to be that way. Um, so the iPhone 6 data, after the, post, the new phone supposedly locks out the NSA. By the way, whenever you see an article claiming someone has locked out the NSA, that just shows that the author is an idiot. I mean, I don't think we are locking the NSA out of anything. I certainly wouldn't be in a hurry to make that claim. You certainly can't prove you locked the NSA out of anything. But past experience has shown the NSA has fancy stuff out of science fiction. So. I wouldn't assume that. But anyways, people certainly want to believe they're locking out the NSA. So it's now encrypted with a key based on your PIN, and Apple can't decrypt it even in response to a court order. They really don't have the key. Now, as the FBI argued in their case, Apple could make custom firmware that would make a brute force attack more effective. In principle, they could, but in practice, they have never done that. At least they say they've never done it, and they've refused to do it, and they have never been forced to do it in court. So, so far, Apple can maintain the statement that they have never helped anybody break into these encrypted devices and they aren't willing to. But they could if they really had to. Um, anyway, but they don't really need to because they've got iCloud and they give that order to the cops and they've got pretty much everything. So then there's Apple Pay. This is the big thing. Everybody wants to quit carrying credit cards and do everything on your phone. And that would probably be more secure if the devices are good enough. Um, Apple Pay has come out here. It uses near field communications. Um, it is probably safer than Google Wallet because iPhones have a secure element and not all Android devices do, although some of them do. Anyway, um, so your app distribution is here. You uh, join the developer program, you make your app, you create a record, you upload it, it is tested, and if Apple approves it, it goes in the store. Anecdotally, people complain very, very much about this process. They claim that Apple is rapacious and brutal. One thing is for sure, they require you to pay 30% of all the money, gross proceeds you make back to Apple as a fee. And when the Kindle app had an option to buy books from Amazon in the app, Apple blocked that and forced them to take it out because you have to buy everything through the Apple app so they get their 30%. Um, and the other thing people say they do is they will, if you make an interesting app, they will approve it for like three months while they clone it and steal it and make an Apple imitation and then they'll kick you out for competing with them and run theirs. So developers put up with all this abuse because there's a lot of money in iPhone apps. So they're willing to be kicked around brutally by Apple for the privilege of selling to Apple people because Apple people think nothing of spending 10 or 20 or 30 bucks on an app. You can't get Android people to spend 99 cents on an app. They want everything to be free. So even though Android is like 85% of the market, all the money is in iOS. So anyway, um, you can put malicious profiles in there. And this is something uh, Tom sent me a note about. There's, um, there's some cool ways to hack iPhone apps without modifying the code, but by modifying sort of the environment variables to control the operation of the code and adding hooks to it. And we'll get there. Another issue is profiles. You can have profiles that allow you to put in unapproved apps. This is one form of side loading. Your company could write an app and then put on a profile saying accept things from our company app. So you could prepare a phone and put on things that are not approved by Apple. And therefore, if you can trick someone into installing a malicious configuration profile, which you might be able to do by social engineering, send them an email, click on this thing, click on that, then they would actually accept your app that's not approved by Apple. And you could sneak a malicious app on the device. So in principle, this is a whole. In practice, I'm not aware of any uh, large number of people being exploited this way, but it is an issue. Um, so you do social engineering to somehow get them to put in these things, and then you can install these unapproved apps in principle. So that's the game there. All right. Uh, they put a malicious version of LinkedIn, and now your LinkedIn is intercepting everything. Um, so there's this thing called the Lacoon Mobile Fortress, which these guys are trying to sell you, which is some kind of app to try to prevent this. Now, I got some eye clickers. What did the city app do?
<laughs> all right, I think it was insecure local storage. Let's see, all right, good. Which problem allows attackers to intercept HTTPS connections? All right, and that's going to be um, X509 validation. That's why you have to validate certificates. The certificate has to say, I am a certificate from like the Google Certificate Authority and the Vera sign at the top. And you have to ask all the intermediate authorities and the one at the top, is this really one? And the one at the top has to be in your list of trusted authorities. That's validating the chain. And various apps and OS have had problems where they don't do validate the chain, and that means you don't really get the benefit of HTTPS. It does not mean that you know who you're talking to. All right, which app had the hidden tethering? That was the handy light. All right, good. A little bit too handy. All right, which app lets you view every file on the phone? All right, that's my Explorer, of course. All right, uh, let me just show you some tricks with Android and some new projects to do, because um, I highly recommend that you start finding Android vulnerabilities. So here is one that I found over Christmas. Um, here we go is some German mapping app. And I went online and I just uh, tested lots and lots of apps. So I went online, found this app. Then I found you can make an account. So I made an account with a test name and password. And then I just looked in the log, and right there it is, putting your password in the log, which is pretty harsh. And uh, so I, I notified them and said, you have a security flaw in your app. And they replied quickly and said, thank you for pointing it out. We forwarded it to somebody. We're going to fix it. We want to have coordinated disclosure. I think they sent me 50 bucks. This was like the best. I sold like 100 people. You know, three of them answered it all. This is, but anyway, they're actually going to fix it. They said, we're going to write a blog post to go with your disclosure. So then I said, OK, when is the fixed version coming out? And the next version won't even run. It won't even start. It just crashes with error messages all over the logs. So I said, well, dude, you know, I, I was going to publish this with my test retest saying it's fixed, but it won't run. And the guy said, it runs fine here. What's wrong? I tried another, and tried another device, tried a much later version of Android. Still just crashes and burns. So they updated it again today. I tried it again today. It just crashes and burns. It won't even start. And I said, well, you could say that's fixed, but that's not usually <laughs> what you mean. Anyway, so I said, I've waited long. And he asked, why didn't you publish your blog post? He said, oh, my corporation won't publish my, my blog post until you publish your report. I said, fine. So I published my report today um, saying, you know, uh, supposedly it's fixed, but I can't retest it because it doesn't work anymore. But anyway, um, it was nice of him to get there. And so I recommend you should do some of this stuff. So here's your project. And there's a series of these. Um, up here, you did observing the Ameritrade log. Make that bigger. OK. The Ameritrade log was just the same in an old version of TD Ameritrade. So you've probably done that one. The Mayo Clinic just has a hard-coded password you can't change that's readable in the source code. So those are really simple problems. Um, here's broken SSL. So you can do a man-in-the-middle attack with burp. You can detect that. And here's um, people that have implemented their own encryption. We've talked about that. Stitcher, they've invented their own stupid Caesar cipher instead of using HTTPS or something sensible like AES. Um, so those are some app, some vulnerabilities you can check for. And here's another couple. Um, so here's the one I talked about the first day. Um, you can add Trojan code to Schwab. Now, Charles Schwab is one of these companies that I notified two years ago, and they just don't care. Um, so that's why I say the first time I taught this class, we used a fake app. Now that we can just use real apps, because there's an enormous number of people with real apps, and they just don't care. So I told Charles Schwab. 500,000 people using this app. I said, you know, you really should protect your code so anybody can't just make a fake Charles Schwab app. And they said, oh, we don't care very much. And they did it originally. However, so the way this works, um, download the app. This is the latest version right in the store right now, updated December last year. Um, so if you go to ADB and connect, you start your device, you should see it connected. Then 
you can just pull the file down. Um, the way it works on Android is you have a data app directory, and in there is every APK file of everything you installed. So they're all just sitting there, so you just have to find the right one. Sometimes the name is a little obscure, but usually you can just guess the name. This is Schwab, so you look for something with Schwab in it, and there it is. So there's the app. You just pull it down out of there from the data app directory, and you've got the Schwab app, which is six megabytes of glorious goodness. Now you have to unpack it with APK tool. By the way, I found when I used my old version of APK tool from a couple years ago, and it took it apart and tried to rebuild it, it wouldn't build. So I Googled the error message, and they said, you just need to upgrade to the latest version of APK tool, and that worked. So get the latest version. I used 2.2.2, that works. There's a bug in APK tool. So you use APK tool, with a D and it will de decompile the app, or I'm not quite sure what the technical term is, but it will unpack the app from the APK file into its component features. And now you can explore the Smalley code. And when you do explore the code, so you have this, here's the APK tool, when you unpack it, it'll make a directory with the same name, and then it'll make folders uh, and files here. Now here you have things like the manifest that have things like those global permissions, access the SD card, access the network. And down here in Smalley is where you have the code, which is what we're going to mess with. And in there, you have folders and subfolders. And if you look at it now, you see most of these folders and subfolders have been changed to like A, B, A, B, C, A, 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 D, A, H. That is what ProGuard does. Now, about a year after I told um, Charles Schwab about this, in 2015, they said, we have addressed the problem by adding obfuscation to our app. So this is it. They turned on ProGuard. ProGuard is completely worthless, but it does look like something has been done. About three quarters of the names changed to like A and B. Before, when I did this in 2015, it looked like this. Smalley, everything was just readable. Android, Google, Swab. So I found a thing called mobile, and a folder called service, and a folder called session, and a thing called session management services, and right in there was the name and password. So everything was just wide open. ProGuard makes this look better to your management by taking about three quarters of it and changing it to A, B, and C, but as you'll see, it, it actually does nothing to prevent the attack it's supposed to be preventing. Um, so, you grep for things. I had to try a few things. The exact string I used to grep isn't there anymore, so that was their other security improvement. They capitalized the U in username, so that my previous grep for username won't find it, and they capitalized the P in password, so it took me a couple tries to get past that. And so to avoid wasting your time, I, I should check the one that works, which is a capital P password, grep recursive, the password, look in the Smalley folder, you'll see about a screen and a half full of answers. And I just tried these one by one until I found the one that worked. And here it is, entertainingly enough, it has been obfuscated, so it is FBI. Um, this is now, instead of being uh, it's in the com Schwab mobile domain mode, FBI.Smalley. That is one of the routines that handles a variable name password. There are about six of them, and I just tried them one by one until I found the one that's actually got the password. And so when you look at that one, um, by the way, if you want to hack into more apps, here's ones I've used before, uh, search strings, to find the goodies in apps. Anyway, so here's the active ingredient. This is that file called i.smalley. And like I say, Smalley code is almost as easy to read as Java. So here is the FBI file. Here's a thing called source file. Here's a thing called A, which is username, and a thing called B, which is password. That's not too confusing to read. And if you just scroll down a little further, you find the constructor. Now, the way these things work, they form a class, and the first time you reference the class, it runs the constructor to construct an element of the class. So the way I find out which files are worth looking at is I put a log entry in every constructor that looks good. I put a log in here and all the things to handle passwords and just saw which one of them appears up in the log that's being called when I log in. So this one, you see here it's going to take A and put it in P1 and here it's going to take B and put it in P2. So it sure looks like if I just take P1 and P2, I'm going to have the username and password and that's it. There's only one other thing. You need to put a label. If you to be classy, we're going to put a label in the log. So we need a variable. This has zero local variables. This routine doesn't use them. So I have to change that to one to make room for a local variable. So there are three changes. You reserve a local variable by changing that to locals one. Anything starting with a pound is a comment. 
And I highly encourage you to put comments whenever you're doing this because it's very easy to make a mistake and break the app so it crashes. And then you're going to wish you could find the last thing you changed and unchange it, or you're going to have to go back and unpack the original file. Um, so this gives me one variable to use. This puts the username in the log. I took that V0 and I put in this. Then I just put out that message and P1. After this, which put A and P1. Then I just do the same thing in the third part. So these green things are all the changes you make in this app. And the, uh, the third one here, the code that the developer put there in line 28 put B in P2, and the code I added put P2 in the log. And that's it. After you've added those 10 lines to the code, you rebuild the app with just build dot to rebuild it out of all the components in this directory. That builds it up. Now you can't install anything yet because you have to sign apps. I have no idea why, because you can sign it with a useless signature, but you have to sign it. So now you can make a self-signed certificate. Now, last time I taught this, we actually used Android Studio to make the certificate, but Android Studio is pretty flaky and buggy and irritating and you don't really need it. You can just make it with Key Tool, which is part of the Java development kit. You run Key Tool. If you doesn't run, you've got to install JDK or fix the path to JDK in your device, which is frustrating, but that's the way Java always is. Once you've got it, um, you just run this mess. This will generate a certificate. It's going to be named your name keystore.jks. It's going to have an alias called self-signed and a password, which is just P-A-S-S-W-R-I-D. A self-signed certificate, it doesn't seem to make much sense to guard it with your life. It doesn't mean anything anyway. They call these things snake oil certificates. It means your software can pretend somebody signed this thing, but in fact, nobody really signed it in a way that means anything. So <coughs> it now asks you the usual boring questions, your name, your company, your city, and all that jazz. So just put anything in there. And uh, now you can sign the code with jar signer, with this key store I created and the alias there I can go into the distribution folder. See, when you build it with APK tool, it creates a dist folder and puts the new APK in there, the one with your modified code. And this will now sign it. If you forget to sign it, you can drag and drop it on Jenny Motion, but it won't install. It'll say, error, look in the log. Can't install this thing because it's not signed. By the way, um, some apps will let you install a new thing signed by somebody else right on top of the old thing without complaining, but not this one. You have to actually uninstall the original app first, or it'll say, wait a minute. I'm not taking a self-signed thing and putting it on top of something signed by Charles Schwab. That seems fishy. I wish they all would notice that. Anyway, you uninstall the thing, then install the modified app. You open opens Charles Schwab, so all you have to do is skip this, and, and um, now run the logcat to see what's going on, and go and log in. You're of course not going to be accepted. I'm not bothering to make real bank accounts. I'm just going to send the username and password up and steal it on the way out. So putting your name and a password, and you will, of course, see it in the log. So that's, that's modifying apps. This is what um, OWASP regarded as the number 10 of the top 10 mobile app vulnerabilities in 2011. They just revised their list in 2016. Now it is number 8 of the top 10. It is not the top vulnerability. Something like code injection and insecure transmissions, like unencrypted over the internet, those are much worse, which is why Charles Schwab doesn't really care. But, you know... It's pretty sleazy, and I would think they would care, but, but they don't. So anyway, that's one project you can do. And there's quite a few steps there, but that's good stuff to learn how to do. Then you can try plain text uh, storing local storage auditing. This is actually fantastically easy. I used to do it in a much more difficult way in a previous semester where I would just uh, use the graphical tool in Android Studio to download all the data from the app and then search it locally. And then I finally said, this is for the birds. I could just be searching it right on the phone with the command line Unix. And that's much better. So here's an app called The Score. I found this around over Christmas. These guys have also ignored their warning for 30 days, so now their homework. About 60 days, really. So this is some kind of sports app. And whatever it is, it's popular. 10 million people are using this junk. And um, so you... Let me shrink this down so it fits on the screen. Okay, so you, you boot this thing up, you can get started. Then it asks you to choose sport teams and stuff. And then you get to create an account. So, of course, sign up with email. I haven't tested the Facebook stuff, but I would like to imagine that they're using the official Facebook API and OAuth, and they're probably not really handling your Facebook password. 
That would be pretty gruesome. It might be worth checking, as a matter of fact, to see if they do something gruesome. I did find an app that pops up a box saying, do you want to store your password with Google Secure Storage? And whether you say yes or no, it stores it in plain text anyway. In addition to putting it in plain text, that's just rude, you know? It might actually be using Google Secure Storage, but they also just stored it in plain text <laughs> on the side. Anyway, um, so make an account with the name of password, a password, P-A-W-S-S-W-R-D, so you know what to look for. You can use something different, but you have to know what it is, because now, that's how you find it. You just put a shell on the device, then you go into the data data directory. See, the data app directory is where the raw APK files are. The data data directory is where the working directory for every app is. So go to data data, and there's a directory for every app. Look for core, and you'll find this thing. It's called COM5 Mobile the Score. I never see anybody use capital letters in these. I always skip the first letter thinking someday they might use a capital S, but they never seem to. Um, all right, so then you can just grep for a part of that password. SSW0 is what I used. And this is a grep recursive to go into that directory and go into all subdirectories and check every file and see if you find anything. And what you'll see is binary file, this crash lytics mess matches. Now that's because grep only wants to look at text files. It doesn't really want to look at binary files. If it does, it's afraid to print the line because certain binary characters will cause your terminal to go to white or Japanese or something screwy so you can't see what you're doing anymore. But if you want to take that risk, you just use grep minus AR, and now it will print out the lines it finds, even in binary files. And here you can see that in that Crashlytics file, it's got your name and your password in plain text, where anybody can steal it. Now, in this one, by the way, I looked in the apps directory in the file system, where it is supposed to put stuff. But if you had a nasty, suspicious mind, you might suspect that these guys, if they're this stupid, how stupid are they? So you can go and look in the root of the whole system, and you will find multiple copies of this thing on the SD card, which is shared by all apps. The, the simulated SD card, there's like three different places where there's a simulated SD card, and it's stored in all of them. So this is, whatever this Crashlytics thing is, I think it's a bug, and some kind of debug log logs everything, and that's what's leading to all these extra copies. Yeah? Did you say Crashlytics? Yeah. I think it's a framework from Twitter for making apps and basically keeping track of track. Of crash logs. Yeah, well, they must have turned on some global feature that, in case of an error, print everything. And that's what's happening. <laughs> that's what it looks like to me. Because it says debug. Debug, and then it prints out your password. So I suspect one possible fix, although pretty sleazy, would be to actually fix whatever the bug is. And then it won't be making all these crash Linux files, but I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so that's, that's another way to test for that sort of thing. So now I encourage you to go find some new vaults. And I made this into official projects, if you like. Um, you can audit an Android app, and you can find a new volume and report it. Just take an app, something we've never used, something you like to use on your phone. When I did this at colleges, they all tried their football team and their colleges app and everything. Then audit it. Just look for things like network communications. Just run it through Burp or even Wireshark. Look to see, are they really using HTTPS at all? A lot of them just send plain text stuff over the network. If they are using HTTPS, try Mad in the Middle Attack with Burp and see if it's really HTTPS or if it's just fake HTTPS that does not check the certificate. Then you can try file storage the way I just did, put in a known password, grep to see if that password appears on the device in plain text, and then see if the log is just spitting out sensitive data. An enormous number of apps do these horrible things wrong. And so this is just an analysis. So then turn in three pictures of this and a summary saying what you found, and it's fine if you prove there's nothing there. Like the NFL app, uh, in 2014, I think, NFL was busted for using plain text network transmissions. So they really cleaned up their app to where it, you can't do any of this with the NFL app. You can't even alter the code in Smalley. As soon as you connect, it says, this app has been damaged. You must update before you continue. So it's cool. They do something like verify the hash or the signature or something before they even run. You can't talk to their server without an authentic app. I don't know why the banks can't be bothered to do that, but that's a pretty good idea. Yeah? That might be something that you can very easily bypass if that check happens in there. I imagine it is. But supposedly, if you pay for Arcsan, they have this integrity control with layers and layers of multiple redundant tests where it really would be very difficult to bypass. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it's something fairly simple, but still it's there. Other people aren't even trying. Anyway, so you can do that. That's a normal uh, audit. Yeah. Just one thing I just wanted to add about the yeah. whole man in the middle assault attack issue is that it's yeah. pretty real and it's even happening today because just two weeks ago, 
the LinkedIn app for iOS was vulnerable to a TLS man, man in the middle attack, and they fixed it. So yeah, the one. I don't know the specific details about a bug, but I do know that it's a big deal because an app as big as LinkedIn, if you can man in the middle and get a password, that's huge. Well, see, when I tell people about that, they fix it. I haven't had anybody tell me, oh, that doesn't matter. They tell me that this code modification doesn't matter. But nobody ignores that. That's, and also, the Federal Trade Commission punished two companies in 2014 for that SSL breaking. Um, Code Credit Karma and somebody at Fandango had that problem. And the FTC declared that that failed to live up to their privacy promise of taking reasonable efforts to protect your data, and they punished them. So there is uh, people have learned that that is not acceptable. This is something you should try, I think. It's an extra credit. You don't have to do it, but I recommend it. Um, audit an app and see how secure it is. This is something you should know how to do because your company will have an app. And as far as I can tell, no companies have any security audit process at all. It's just amazing what garbage is out there. Even This is not a thorough security audit, but just looking for like a few of the top 10 errors would be better than nothing. And then the next one is find a new one. Find a unknown Android vulnerability. Test some apps. You won't have to go far. By the way, if you want apps that are garbage, just put in the word lawyer or attorney. Three out of four of them do one of these horrible things, in my experience. They are the worst. I don't know why. The people make apps for attorneys for you to like tell them things that are really private that just spray your data around like a drunken sailor. It's amazing. Um, anyway. But um, try some apps, find a new one. This, this one could be a lot of work because you have to find some bone in not one of the apps that I didn't write up for homework. Um, find a serious problem, then make a proof of concept and report that says, here I am, prove it. Don't just say the code can be modified. Make it do something horrible, like steal the credit card number or the password. You know, that's because no manager cares about technically the HTTPS connection was made when it shouldn't have been made. They say, show me something that matters. Show me a credit card leaking or a password, then maybe I care. That's what a proof of concept is. So make a report of some kind that shows this. And then um, let me see it. And if it's good, that's worth 30 points. And if you want to continue, you can demonstrate it to the class here, which would be fine. And you can also report it to the company. Um, and those will all be good things. And you might as well get in the game. Um, more, I've been checking. There's a lot of people whose bug bounty programs claim to include Android. So I submitted maybe 15 or 20 of those last week. I'm very skeptical. In my experience, whenever I submit bug bounties, they always say, oh, that doesn't count. I say, yes. um, but they're slowly waking up. Now some of them have the Android in scope. So, but they don't like hearing this. They always have an idea that what they're going to hear is some kind of mathematical problem in how they made the cookie. And they don't want to hear something like, you stored the password in plain text. They're like, well, that doesn't count. That's a design issue. So, well, dude. <laughs> it's, anyway. Um, that's the way it is. So uh, I think there are any more of these worth mentioning. Oh, yeah. All right. So there's a few more Android apps. And I'll have some more uh, iOS apps coming later. Um, but you should start doing Android security audits because Android is an appalling mess. And everybody has an Android app. And if you, in my opinion, you should actually do these tests. And if they don't pass these tests, you should refuse to pay your developer and say, all right, try again. <laughs> Nobody should be selling apps that do these stupid things. And they really are. Anyway, anybody got any questions or anything? Is yeah. there a, any kind of blog or repository that says we've, already, we've checked out all these Android apps and these have already been well documented? In terms of no. They would be nice. And then there, there first has to be some agreement on what the test should be, and I haven't even seen that. Um, what I've seen is professionals write a list of how to really audit an app, and it is like 40 pages, much, much more than this. This is a very cursory. This is what Mudge said. He wants to make like UL listing for cybersecurity, where you buy something and you can have some degree of confidence in it. And right now, I think there's no agreement. The pros say you should have tested these 100 complicated things. The wimps like me said you should have tested these three simple things. And they say, how much does it take to make it safe? And the answer is, well, even if you test everything, it's still not safe. So uh, we're headed. They would be, we're not really going to get anywhere until there is some kind of mark on a product that consumers understand when they buy it, like Dolphin Safe. This is a safe enough iPhone app to install. But we're we're nowhere near that. Yeah. If that was the case, then is there any way that you could have this sticker or whatever where it, it's more than just a set of guidelines that you have to follow? But it's been shown that security cannot be done by a series of bullet points that you look at, verify, and then you're done. It's a continuous process, and if if you just have one hole, then the whole thing fall, falls apart. Well, all right, you can say that, but the only framework for that is ISO 27000. That's what the military requires. 
and it takes five years and costs like $10 million to implement. So every app would cost a thousand bucks if you did that, um, where you actually have to prove that you have a series of audits and continuous improvement. That's, so that's out of reach. That's why, you know, UL listing was the example. There was simple electrical safety, like the chassis doesn't have hot voltage, there is a ground wire, there is like a fuse. There were like a few simple electrical safety things they agreed on that were not too complicated to test, and it didn't require you to spend a million bucks, and now you could stamp that on the box and people knew it was okay to buy this toaster. So the question is, can we do that? Would that really be of any benefit? And the jury's still out, I think. Doesn't the World yeah. Wide Web have like certificate authorities? They used to put their little symbol right on the bottom of the web page. Well, you mean there's things like hacker safe site and stuff? Yeah, a bunch of them do. And by the way, there are several blogs showing how you can use those to hack into websites. <laughs> um, I've got some on my website because what happens is it, those things will change when you introduce a vulnerability. So all you have to do is go into like the Wayback Machine and look at the versions, see when that thing said it's not secure, what was the latest code added, and then you find the vuln. So those things actually could be arguably doing the opposite of what they're supposed to do. And it's certainly true that there's a ton of websites that have McAfee safe website and they're hacked. The picture of anonymous guy there, you know. <laughs> so I mean, that's the problem with all this. It is not true that even if you pass some audit, that means you're safe. There's still a bunch of other problems, like social engineering and stuff. That's, I think, why so many vulnerabilities last so long, like code injection, because it's not one person's fault. The PHP is working fine, the MySQL is working fine. You can steal all the data, but both of them say it's not my fault. My code is fine. It's, that's often the case. So anyway, all right, I guess that's it. I'm going to record who won these eye clickers and give you some points. Then I'll clean up and go to the lab. Probably take me a little while to get there.